Hey everyone, welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Matt Bonjovi, and I am so excited to be joined today by Stephen Walker. Stephen is an historian, author, and award-winning documentary director. His previous book, Shockwave, Countdown to Hiroshima, was a New York Times bestseller and is currently in development as a movie. Additionally, Stephen's films have won numerous awards, including an Emmy, a BAFTA, and the Rose Door, Europe's most prestigious documentary award. Stephen is here with us today to talk about his new book, Beyond, the astonishing story of the first human to leave our planet and journey into space. Beyond tells the thrilling story behind the epic flight made by Yuri Gagarin, the first human ever in space. The book unpacks secrets that were hidden for decades, and it takes the reader into the drama of one of humanity's greatest adventures. And that's what we'll be delving into today to get a taste of that drama and excitement. Now, throughout our talk, you might have some great questions popping into your head. And when you do, please go ahead and add them to the YouTube chat on the right. We will have time shortly for Stephen to answer some of these. So be sure to get your questions in early. But first, Stephen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Wonderful to be here. Thank you. Yeah. So can you take us back to October of 1957 when the world changed quite dramatically with the Soviet satellite Sputnik being put into orbit? What was the world like at this moment and, and how did things change when Sputnik arrived? The world at that moment in 1957 is an incredibly dangerous place. I mean, it's an incredibly dangerous place. You've got essentially a major confrontation between the two superpowers of the USSR on the one side and essentially the West led by the United States on the other. You've got a mass proliferation of nuclear weapons. I mean, there's an incredible number of nuclear weapons, particularly on the American side. You've got a contest in the world for the hearts and minds of neutral countries, which could, it's very hard of us to think that like this these days, could go either way, could go communist, could go Western democratic. There really is a major divide in the world. And into the middle of this, in 1957, in the autumn, the Soviets do something extraordinary. They fling the world's first satellite into orbit. And now for us, looking back 64 odd years later, that may not seem such an extraordinary achievement. At the time, it was not only extraordinary, but for almost every single American citizen, it was terrifying. Because suddenly, the Americans are being watched from a Soviet ball that is beeping out a signal all the time, that is absolutely unassailable. You can't reach it, you can't shoot it down. And it suggests the possibility that in the very near future, more of these things, possibly armed with hydrogen bombs, could destroy the United States of America. So it's a terrifying moment. And Americans are going, this is a nation, the Soviet Union, that isn't supposed to be able to build working refrigerators, and yet right. incredibly, they put a satellite into space. Right, and this really kind of fuels what we know now today as, as the space race. Yeah. And the USSR and the, and the West led by the US took somewhat different approaches. Can, can you talk yeah. about how they were going about each thinking about this race and, and what their goals were in it? Well, for, the, for most of the first two or three years, the Americans were hopelessly losing. <laughs> right. Even though they were the technologically supposed to be the richest, most powerful nation on earth. I mean, you know, the Soviets were chucking up these ever bigger and bigger satellites. They were putting dogs inside them. The Americans couldn't get anything off the ground. They, I mean, the first satellite they tried to put up was the size of a grapefruit and the rocket carrying it actually managed to get a couple of inches off the pad, landed back and then blew up in front of the world's cameras. And it was that humiliating. So for the Americans, things were going really badly wrong. So they come up with this idea, what would be the most incredible thing we can do to restore our preeminence, not just technologically, but politically, ideologically, in the sense of our status as a great power in the world stage? And the answer is to put humans in space, to put the first human in space. So they commit to a human, they call it a man at the time, because it was men that we're dealing with, there's a big argument about that at the time as well. Mm -hmm. They put the first human space program together and they select a bunch of pilots who are top test type pilots in the country. I mean, these are guys with the right stuff. They are these cool hotshot pilots that fly the fastest, most dangerous planes on the planet at that time. And after a rigorous selection process, these guys are then paraded in front of the world's press 
1959, and the whole press corps stands up and clears <laughs> them. I mean, they are celebrities before any one of them has set foot into space. They are really rock stars at their time. These are gladiators. Think of it as gladiators. These are guys who are willing to kind of take on the cause and die if necessary for their country, because no one knew what was gonna happen with a human being in space. Nobody knew if their eyeballs would pop out. Nobody knew if they could breathe. Nobody knew if weightlessness would cause your circulation to stop. Nobody knew if you'd go insane. There was a real problem with something called space horror. And they were terrified that human beings could actually go insane when they're sort of divorced from the world up there in the emptiness of space. So they have this program that comes out, big, colorful, great characters, you know, real all-American heroes. Yeah. The Soviets are watching. And in total silence, without any fanfare whatsoever, in complete and absolute state secrecy, to the point where if you acknowledged you knew anything about this program, you're off to a gulag. They also select a bunch of guys, younger guys in their 20s, all of them are serving Air Force pilots. And they select not seven of them, which the Americans do, the Americans call them the Mercury Seven. They select 20. And they select them through an even more rigorous process. And they select them in total secrecy. And they start training them in total secrecy. And when I mean secrecy, I mean secrecy. I mean, they're not even allowed to tell their wives what they are doing. I mean, it's that secret, okay? They can't tell their families anything at all. So they start training in absolute secrecy. So you have two sets of gladiators, the American hotshot, right stuff, famous rock star celebrity pilots on the one hand, and this secret group of 20 younger cosmonauts, all serving military pilots, who are unknown, no fanfare, no press, not even their families know what they're doing. And this is the duel. This is the competition between the two sets of gladiators, which will result in just one victory. And this is my story. Yeah. And you mentioned that the US astronauts, they were kind of paraded out and it was a whole big to do. But yeah. also at that time, you said that the, the USSR was having some success putting animals into orbit, um, which the US was not. Was there even then a whiff that the Soviets were thinking about putting a human into space or how was the there US were thinking about that? There were whiffs, but nobody quite knew on the right. American side what was going on over there. I mean, you, right. it's very hard for us to imagine the degree of secrecy that actually existed and how hard it was to know quite what was going on on the other side of the Iron Curtain. So there were little tantalizing hints that were kind of said. I mean, in, interesting, one of the American astronauts, I think it was John Glenn, who famously went into space later in 1962, actually said, we don't even know what we're fighting against. Right. Every single <laughs> launch, that the Soviets did with animals that they were doing to pave the way for human flight was conducted in secrecy. If it went well, which it very rarely did, by the way, then they would parade it as a success. If it went wrong, they'd either hide it completely or they also parade it as a success. In other words, they'd say, well, this is how it was meant to happen, even though it didn't happen that way. And they were so paranoid, the Americans, uh, the Russians, or the Soviets, I should say, were so paranoid. I mean, this is amazing that they even placed bombs on their spacecraft with dogs inside them so that if anything went wrong and the spacecraft happened to enter the Earth's atmosphere at the wrong point so that it would actually end up maybe in America by mistake or in a Western capitalist nation right. by mistake, these bombs were triggered to explode, taking the dogs with them. Right. So they would literally, and it happened more, and, and one particular case, it happened in December 1960, they just blew up the capsule when it was heading in the wrong direction. I think it was heading towards China in that instance, it just right. blew up. So the idea that the Americans would put animals with bombs inside their capsule, <laughs> it didn't happen, but the KGB insisted. So they're that paranoid and that protective of their secrets. Yeah. And did this secrecy versus kind of the mass transparency that the US was employing, did that impact how like the risk trade-offs were, were considered by the space programs? And the yeah, that's that a they were very, very to... good point, Matt. I mean, basically, if you do things in secret, you can get away with anything. Almost. Right. We know that, you know that today from, the, right. you know, from China and from the sort of what is Russia today, that things, you know, you, you don't parade them and you can do things that are, you know, you do not have a liberal, open, Western democratic press 
in the Soviet Union in 1960. And what that actually means is that if launches, as I said, if things blow up, then you can kind of get away with it. I mean, you, everything is secret. I mean, I mean, the, if you look at the kind of sort of the rockets that we're dealing with, and I show um, a picture, number three, actually, if you can just pop that one up for a moment. This is the rocket that was used to send up both Sputnik, the satellite, the world's first satellite, and the dogs, and finally Yuri Gagarin. It was actually an intercontinental ballistic missile called the R-7. It is revolutionary in its design. It is, in fact, at that time, by far the biggest missile in the world. Yuri Gagarin becomes, as we'll maybe talk about later, the first human being to sit on top of that thing. And just to show you just how extraordinary the design of that is, if we actually look at the next picture, 3A, and you look at a picture today, I took that in September 2019 at the Cosmodrome in Baikonur, it's almost exactly the same rocket. So the technology that they developed in the 1950s is almost exactly the same as it was, as it has, it is exactly the same as what is being used today to send people to the International Space Station. The Russians kept that rocket totally secret. Obviously the CIA were doing their best to find out about it. And in fact, they had a spy satellite system, incredibly called Corona. Can you believe it? <laughs> they had a spy satellite system called Corona that was tops, it was so secret that very, very few people were allowed to know about it at all. That would actually fly around the planet. And every time it flew over the missile complex, which it had already identified, it was taking photographs, which were then going back to the CIA. This is in 1960, it's quite incredible. Right. And they had, so they kind of knew about these rockets, they knew, but they didn't know all the details about them, but they knew enough to know the Soviets had these huge, heavy, powerful missiles that could deliver hydrogen bombs on New York, a quarter of the way across the planet, and destroy the whole of New York City in 1957. Right. And this rocket would therefore also be big enough to send a human being into orbit. Right. And then what then was the technical challenge specifically from the Soviet side in terms of, you said they used that rocket to put the dogs into space. What was the challenge in then making the leap to putting a human in space? Incredibly, what they do effectively is they add a third stage to this rocket and then effectively on the top, they put a capsule. And this capsule essentially replaces the thermonuclear warhead that was previously there. <laughs> One of the conditions of these cosmonauts, as they were called, that were picked after this very rigorous selection process for training was that they had to be short and they had to be light. Right. <laughs> they're basically about the same size as a nuclear bomb. Right. Essentially, that's what they're doing. And they're going inside a little capsule. Let me just show you a great picture. This, if we look at actually a typical picture of one of these capsules, this is in fact the capsule that Yuri Gagarin did fly around the world in. I'll show you the picture in a moment. At 10 times the speed of a rifle bullet in 106 minutes, we're talking 18,000 miles an hour. This is fast enough to get from New York to London in 12 minutes. And if you look at picture number 22, you'll see what we're dealing with. I mean, it's quite an incredible thing. That is yeah. what the first human being went around the world in. I mean, that is Wallace and Gromit, isn't it, really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what it is. That's what he went, and that's exactly the same thing that the dogs went inside. It was exactly right. the same thing. It is a ball, that's what it is. It is right. a sphere which is just about big enough to contain a human being. I mean, right. the risks are unbelievably loaded against any occupant, canine or human, inside that sphere. Yeah. And how then did that compare with NASA's approach? Were they using roughly the same concept? Well, see, the, 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 the America, this is a very interesting paradox that happened at the time. The Soviets had these great big rockets that could put human beings into orbit. You need a lot of power. You need to get up to about 18,000 miles an hour in order to actually get a spacecraft into orbit. So they didn't come down again like a cannonball. And the reason why the Soviets had these great big rockets is because they were great big missiles carrying great big bombs. The right. Soviet bombs were heavy. They were quite primitive. The Americans had much more advanced thermonuclear weapons, which were much lighter. So they had much right. lighter rockets, which meant great for nuclear weapons, not great for getting humans into <laughs> orbit. So what they ended up with were smaller rockets that at first 
could only put humans into a suborbital trajectory, which is exactly what, for example, Bezos is doing right now with the new Shepard rocket that is going up actually, uh, I think next month with, with Bezos actually inside it. It is, it, is the, it is the blue origin. It is the same thing. It is a ballistic, it's a cannonball, up, down. Right. Thing. So their capsules are slightly different. We've got a picture of one. They're also tiny. Number 31 is, gives you an instance of what we're actually dealing with. And you can see that is, it looks like a sort of dustbin, doesn't it really? I mean, it's got yeah. kind of, it, it really does look like, in fact, what you're looking at there is state-of-the-art technology in 1961. It's so small also that I think, again, John Glenn famously said, you don't actually get inside a mercury capsule, you pull it on, is what you do. <laughs> um, and the purpose of that thing was to get up into space and be up there for about 15 minutes and then come down into the Atlantic Ocean. So we're not talking about orbit, but we are talking about a space. And right. that is ultimately what matters. Which of these nations, which of these superpowers is going to be the first, whether it's orbit or this. And the race between them will come down, as I describe in my book, to three weeks. After two years of this work, it comes down, it's a photo finish between the two. And it's totally uncertain for a long time, which one of those is going to make it first. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll come to that flight soon. But before that, the we mentioned that the U.S. astronauts had this this enormous sense of celebrity, whereas the cosmonauts were completely yeah. anonymous. How did that impact? Yeah, how did that impact the lives of, of the astronauts versus the cosmonauts? Okay, well that's that's the money issue, isn't it? I mean, right. <laughs> so what happened is is that it always comes back to the money, isn't it? The astronauts, the seven Mercury Seven celebrity rock yeah. star guys, they do a deal. Um, let me show you a picture. I've got a great picture of them. Number five, if you can get that up, which shows you what they kind of look like in their sort of, you know, silver lined. I love this picture because it's so of its era. <laughs> that, that is the Mercury 7. Those are America's heroes. Not one of them had flown in space when that photograph had taken place. By yeah. And I love those kind of silver aluminized suits that they're wearing. It's so kind of obvious. They're lost in space. You know, it's really, yeah. Yeah. it's fantastic. Those guys did a deal with Life magazine. Life magazine at the time was, it's difficult to kind of think of it in these days, but it was a huge weekly magazine, pictorial magazine, which had an enormous circulation across the whole of America. They did an exclusive deal with Life magazine, which was worth a fortune. So they were rich, they were famous, they were constantly in the news, all of that stuff was going on. They lived well, they were given their own jets to fly by NASA. They had right. supersonic jets to get around the country to the various training areas, like down at Cape Canaveral and elsewhere. They need to, so they, rather than put them on commercial flights, they yeah. just had their own jets and they flew there. It was like- That's that. quite a perk of the job. <laughs> yeah, I know. So uh, now contrast this with the Soviet side, okay? You've got a bunch <laughs> of guys, 20 of them, living in a sort of, a block of, I've seen it, an apartment block in a place called Chkalovsky, where at first the apartments are tiny. They don't have a telephone. They have no TV. They have no refrigerator. They're on kind of officer's pay as serving fighter pilots, which is not very much. Right. They don't have, not one of them has a car. One of them actually manages to afford a motorbike, but that motorbike gets, it doesn't get used. They can be on their bus. There are absolutely no private jets for anyone. <laughs> right. I mean, and they can't tell their families anything about what they're up right. to. Right. So they are, and, 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 you know, and their training is different. I mean, it's similar, but it's also different. The bits that are similar are probably also because the Americans publicize everything. So the Soviets are reading all this stuff and they just basically duplicate some of the training programs that the Soviets, that the Americans are doing, but they do more. What they also do is an intense course, can you believe this, of physical exercise and acrobatics. I mean, we've got a picture, number seven, of the kind of training that we're actually talking about. That is a man called Gemma <laughs> Tito, we might talk about later, upside yeah. down. And, you know, they did trampolining. I mean, what, they were actually, one of the guys actually who trained them says in his diary that they were, almost up to trampolining standards of a circus by the time they were able to fly. <laughs> Can you imagine that for the American? So they got, they were the fittest, healthiest men on the planet. I mean, one of them actually says that by 1960. So you've got a massive training. You've also got a communist indoctrination exercise program too. Right. So they have to do all of that as well. 
you know, their communist credentials are really, really important. Obviously, they have to be. So they have to be versed up and all that stuff as well. You don't get that on the American side. <laughs> We've got a very, there are areas which are kind of weirdly parallel because they're, both sides are going to be exposed to the most hostile regime ever encountered by any or, organism that exists on this planet in three and a half billion years of its history. Right. But at the same time, there are very, very, very key differences. The Americans had no fitness program whatsoever. <laughs> they were just, they, if they wanted to, they did it. If they didn't want to, they didn't have to. I mean, some did. John Glenn famously was a constant jogger and he's always been photographed jogging on the beach yeah. uh, for the cameras. But actually a lot, bother. Right, they weren't going to join Cirque du Soleil the way the, the Russians were. I mean, I think the thing is, Matt, the key thing here is what lies behind all of this is an ideological difference. Right. Fundamentally, the point about a cosmonaut is that he wasn't going to fly his spaceship. He was going to sit in an automated spacecraft at huge personal risk and fly in it around the world without actually touching anything because they didn't want them to touch anything. They were like space dogs. I mean, let me show you a picture of what a space dog looks like. Number 34 gives an example of one of the 42, I believe, dogs that were actually sent into space by or on rockets by the Soviets, 42 of them. They were trained, interesting enough, they were actually trained by circus trainers and they were trained to be confined in those kind of suits for literally weeks at a time, if necessary, right. from the first few minutes to weeks and weeks. This is the world of Pavlov's dogs, essentially. Right. And the cosmonauts, even though they were fighter pilots themselves, there was an element in which, a bit like the wider Soviet society, that their role was to obey, their role was to do what they were told effectively and to endure whatever was thrown at them. And you can see it fascinatingly in the construction of the cockpits of the two spacecraft. If we just have a look at the American one, number eight, look at the inside of the Mercury capsule and just hold that picture for a moment. What you've got there is state-of-the-art technology in 1960-61. You've got a, a, it looks a bit like a, a, a fighter pilot cockpit actually, which is appropriate yeah. given these guys are right stuff, hotshot test pilots. You've also got on some handles on the sort of left-hand side, those kind of white handles, if people can see them, you've got an element of actual manual control. A lot of the flight will be automated as well. And these capsules would eventually go into orbit aboard bigger rockets. So there was an element of manual control also, which was insisted on by the Mercury astronauts. Just look at the complexity of that cockpit and now go to picture nine, which is the inside of the sphere that I showed you earlier on. And you'll see the difference. That is the inside of a Vostok, it was called, sphere. There are four dials, basically, right. in front of the guy sitting there. And to his right, there is actually something which looks like a 1960s car radio, which is essentially <laughs> what it was. I mean, he was essentially out of communication for most of the time he was actually traveling around the Earth. I mean, imagine, we're so used to the Apollo and all the rest of it, all those beeps and communications. Here, you've got a guy in space talking to nobody because he can't reach anybody at all. And there was no attempt really for him to train him properly in the exercise of manual control until the very end. And even then the controls were locked by a code that he was only given in an envelope that was stuck inside that cockpit <laughs> at the very, very, very last moment. So you're talking about somebody who is being, who's not in control. Right. His job, like a space dog, is actually to survive this mission. Right. And had he not survived this mission, and the chances were more than 50% that he wouldn't survive this mission, we wouldn't be talking about him today. Yeah. He would have disappeared. You know, right. there would be nothing at all. And in fact, the KGB, just a few days before the flight itself that Yuri Gagarin was on, there is actually a meeting, which is in the book, a secret, secret meeting, where there is a discussion with the head of the KGB security service to put the same bomb on the human flight that was right. also put on the animal flights. So that, that guy in there, whoever it was, we, it's Yuri Gagarin in the end, but that, wasn't, that choice had still not been made. Whoever ended up in there, if he started to go crazy, if he started to do something like press all the buttons, if he started to defect, maybe right. take 
spacecraft and head off to the United States of America, he'd be blown up. And it was only at the last moment, a week to 10 days before the flight, that he that this KGB, meat-faced KGB general, <laughs> was actually overruled. And as a result, the bomb was not put up. You know, imagine they put a bomb on Neil Armstrong's, you know, yeah. it's just, it's insane. Like, yeah. If this thing can get to the moon, we'll just blow it up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's absurd on the face of it, I think. Yeah, it's a lot of absurdity in the story. That's what's yeah. Yeah. So, of course, one of the centerpieces of your book is Yuri Gagarin, and I think a lot of people know the name, but they don't know much else about him. Yeah. Can you mm. tell us who he was and, and where he yeah. was from? Yeah, I mean, he's a really interesting character, actually. He is, um, he comes from this kind of, he comes from this kind of, um, to use the, his own words, peasant background in the Soviet Union. He's about 80, he lives in a, in, a, in a little village, or brought up in a little village, about 80 kilometers to the west of Moscow. And I've been there and, and actually we've got a picture of his house. It's number 17. And this house is actually built out of birch and it was built by his own father. He was a carpenter. His father built every bit of that house, completely wow. built that house. And when something very, very extraordinary happened to Yuri Gagarin when he was seven years old, when he was seven years old, the Soviet Union was invaded by Nazi Germany across the biggest invasion front in history in 1941. And these enormous, I think it's across a 1500 mile front, German tanks raced across the border in June, 1941. And the little village of Plushino, which is where Gagarin lived in that house as a little boy with three siblings and his two parents was right in the path of the advancing German army and they swept into the village on their way basically to Moscow. They swept into the village. They rounded everybody up. They burned 27 buildings down. They burned down the village school. They slaughtered all the cattle. And a bunch of SS men took over that house you've just seen a picture of. And Yuri Gagarin and his family were forced to build an underground dugout with the permission of the Germans in the back garden, in the backyard, where they then lived for the next two and a half years. I've got a picture of it, number 18. If you can just hold that picture up for a moment, number 18. That is just a picture that I took. That is the inside. Uh, it, you can still go there today. And this, is, this has been slightly reconstructed, but it really was like this. Uh, that is the inside of, that is where Yuri Gagarin and his entire family, six of them lived. No schooling. He was taught by his mother a little bit. And then something horrific happened. And it was just a, a little bit more than seven years old, I think. Something horrific happened. He had a little brother called Boris, who was five. And one day, one of the SS officers living in the house, who took a dislike to this little boy, Boris, decided he would just hang him from a tree in the garden. Um, we have a picture of the garden, which is number 19. And if you just hold that pitch for a moment, I don't believe it's one of those trees because they're too young, but it was that garden. So this little boy was hanged at the age of five from the tree and Yuri Gagarin saw it happen. And he was seven and he tried to cut his brother down from a branch of the tree. The guy, the officer just walked away from it and he couldn't get his brother down. And then he rushed to the dugout where his mother was screaming for help. And his mother, whose name was Anna, came rushing out and incredibly, she was able to cut her little boy down from that tree. And amazingly, the little boy survived, but he wasn't able to talk for months. I mean, it was horrific. And Gagarin witnessed all this. And you know, his own sisters said, the boy changed, Gagarin changed. Something changed in him. Something changed in him at the age of seven. And that something was a kind of a grit and a kind of a toughness and a kind of a, an inner reliance, a, a something that enabled him when he was, in whatever he was, 27 years old in 1961, to sit on top of the world's biggest nuclear missile without a nuclear warhead, which no other human being had ever done, with a less than 50% chance of being alive in the next few minutes, and somebody lights the candle, and he's able to take that pressure and do it. It's connected to that terrible moment that he had when he was a child and the Nazis ran over his village and tried to kill his own brother. Right. 
So then how does he go? He's, he's this now gritty young child. How does he come to the attention of the cosmonaut recruitment process and get involved in all of that? Well, he actually ends up after the war going to study foundry work. He goes to a college in a place called Saratov, which is what they call a closed city. I visited it now um, on the Volga River, about, I'm sure I'll be corrected, about six, seven hundred kilometers south of Moscow. And he's there as a student and he becomes fascinated by books about space, actually, when he's there. Right. I mean, it's almost coincidental. And he becomes captain of the basketball team. He becomes very social, goes out with girls, good looking. He's got this great, big, very attractive, very winning smile. But there's this inner thing going on. Right. And there's a local flying club that's actually organized by the Communist Party. <laughs> um, and they have these, so they get, that's how they get people into the Air Force. So he starts, and there's a lot of indoctrination that goes on, political indoctrination at the same time. He joins that. He learns to fly. And then he's given a, he becomes quite good at it. And there then comes the opportunity to join the Air Force or to go on with iron foundry work. And he decides he's going to, perhaps <laughs> not that surprisingly, to fly fast jets in the Air Force. <laughs> so he ends up in an air base, which is right on the fault line, the NATO fault line, on the border of Norway. He's literally a few miles from that border, right up in the freezing north of Russia, of the Soviet Union, where the winters go on for months and for weeks on end, the sun never, never arises above the horizon at all. It's just black 24 seven. And he goes there with his young wife. You know, I don't think she liked it very much. <laughs> They're living in this darkness, but he loves it because the flying is kind of risky. It's dangerous, yeah. it's dark, there's snow, there's terrible weather, howling Arctic winds, all of that stuff. And one day in late, I think 1959, a bunch of doctors, two of them actually, turn up at the airfield and they interview him and a bunch of other pilots. And they interview them about this new type of flying machine, but they don't say what it is. And they ask him if he'd be interested in volunteering for tests to see if he was actually able to join a program to fly this new type of flying machine. And he thinks they're talking about helicopters. That's what he thinks. <laughs> and he's not sure whether to take it on or not. Helicopters, <laughs> fast jets, I don't know. But yeah. he decides to go for it. And he ends up with a bunch of other guys from other bases who had the same interviews, who've been selected from three and a half thousand applicants. And they whittle them down in a series of medical tests, which are truly horrific. <laughs> I mean, they investigate every single bit of your insides, outside, psychological, I mean, everything you know. And people fall out like flies from these tests, you right. know, in this hospital where they're not told, they're not given that, not allowed to use their own names. They're not allowed to say why they're there, not that they even knew themselves exactly why they were there. Yeah. And at the end of a four week period of rigorous, horrific, brutal, sadistic <laughs> testing, these 20 are selected, and Yuri Gagarin is one of those 20. So that's how he gets onto the cosmonaut training corps. But being a good Soviet citizen, he doesn't tell his wife, just as he's told he's not supposed to tell his wife. Right. Finally, it gets to six months down the line, when they've been training for six months, and they're given permission by the authorities to tell just their wife. <laughs> and so right. suddenly, his wife, this woman that she's up there in the Arctic, and her, son's gonna, her husband's gonna kill himself in some terrible jet weather-related accident, or perhaps in a war with the United mm. States across right. or NATO. Or on the other hand, he's now gonna go into space. I mean, what right. does that even mean? What does that even mean? And that's where he is in late 1960. Right. And you talked about these these twenty cosmonauts that are then being whittled down. And Further. another, yeah, another important one is uh, German Titov. Can you yeah. tell us a bit about him? Yeah, yeah. So he, I mean, he is. These two end up being the rivals for number one. Okay, they they have incredible abilities, both of them, but they're very different. Gagarin has this peasant background. He's got the perfect Soviet biography. He's got a very, let's have a look at what he looks like, for goodness sakes. We should see what he looks like. Let's have a look at him in, let's have a look at both of them. Number 16. You just hold the picture for a moment if we could, in number 16. The man on the left is German, Titov. The man on the right is Yuri Gagarin. You can see that smile straight away. So there they are, both actually very short, um, both very charismatic. Um, they are the best of friends. I mean, they really are. They live in they live in adjoining apartments with their wives and child. They are 
they hop over each other's balconies for drinks. They, I mean, they are really, really close and they're both competing for number one. It's becoming more and more obvious. And they both know that whichever one becomes number one is, is destined for a kind of immortality, the first human being in space, the first organic thing to leave this planet. And as it were, look down on the earth if he makes it there alive. What's really interesting about those two guys is this, not only are they rivals, not only are they best friends, but what makes it a gift in a way for a writer, because it's much more interesting and complex than just they're both rivals, is that German Titov and his wife Tamara had a child approximately the same age as Yuri Gagarin and his wife Valentina, and the child was a few months old. And in late 1960, so we're just a few months now before the first flight, in late 1960, this, this little boy that the Titovs had called Igor, who was just a few months old, died. And it was such a tragedy that when I actually interviewed Tamara Titov, German is now dead, but German's wife in Moscow a couple of years ago, less than a couple of years ago, 18 months ago, she was not able to speak about it. It was too traumatic for her, understandably, but she did not want to talk about it. But I know from other witnesses that Yuri Gagarin, and his wife Valentina were like rocks of support. I mean, they were like rocks of support for the Titans. It was an incredible moving support mechanism between these two great friends. So what you've got are not just two best friends, not just two people who happen to live in adjoining apartments and have similar interests in their training and all the rest of it, but this, this, they're united. There's a tragedy. You know, there's this, there's, there's Gagarin with his little brother who nearly died. There is Titov, who he's there for, and perhaps that was part of the connection, who'd lost his son. They are kind of united in this sort of tragedy as well. And yet only one of them can be first. And the decision is only made three days before the flight. I mean, it's just incredible that this went on and on. You know, they just, nobody could quite decide which one of these two were destined either to die in a gruesome way, maybe being marooned in space or blown up or whatever it happens to be, or which one of them was destined for this, this potential immortality. Gagar we know what happened when that selection was made because we have access to a secret diary that I use in the book that was written completely illegally by the head of cosmonaut training, it's like a fly on the wall, by the head of the cosmonaut training group. A guy called Kamanin, who's this kind of Stalinist figure who's keeping this secret diary. And this guy is actually noting down all these secret meetings that take place. And he describes the moment. He calls them into his office three days before the flight. And he picks out Gagarin and not Titov. And Titov, his world collapses in that moment. And he comes out of that meeting. He's now designated as Tito, as Gagarin's backup in case anything goes wrong with Gagarin. He gets ill or he has a fall or goes mad or something like that. So he comes out, Tito, and one of the fellow cosmonauts comes up to him, a good friend, and says, hey, listen, you know, you're number two. I mean, it doesn't matter. You're going to go to space. And he says to this friend, Tito says to this friend, he says, who was the first man to discover America? And the guy says, Christopher Columbus. And then he says, and who was the second? And this guy says, I don't know. And right. Tito says, that's the point. You don't right. know. And that haunted him until the day he died in 1990s. He did go up second, but nobody remembers second. They only remember first. Right. And you mentioned that there was this sort of friendly rivalry between them. What was the role of the rivalry, not amongst just these men, but also between the US and the USSR in terms of pushing these boundaries and, and making these risks happen? Well, actually, the rivalry fundamentally comes down. Again, one of these things about my book is a duel. You've got a duel between gladiators. You've got a duel between the first two cosmonauts. You've actually got a duel between the first two American astronauts, John Glenn and Alan Shepard. And then there's a duel between the two geniuses right. who are responsible for all of this stuff happening. On the, on the Soviet side, you've got a guy that was so secret that his name was not released at all in his lifetime. It was responsible for everything. That missile we just saw, the Sputnik that we talked about at the beginning of this talk, the first dog, all the dog flights in space, Yuri Gagarin, I mean, everything. His name was Sergei Korolev, and he was the biggest Soviet state secret of all. 
He was the architect of the missile program, the space program, the everything program. He's this kind of squat, tough, I've got a picture of him, actually very paternal looking guy, number 11, if we could, shows you a picture of what Korolev looked like. So he's the guy on the right. That is a top secret picture. That picture could never have, if you can hold it for a moment, could never have been released in his lifetime. Um, when he did die of a botched operation, which was conducted by the Soviet Minister of Health, can you believe it, it was the guy doing this operation? Um, they discovered a huge cancer inside and he'd been building for some time. And he actually, and he actually um, died on the operating table. But look at how he looks at Yuri Gagarin. Um, I interviewed his daughter, now in her 80s, in Moscow, in her apartment, which is like a sort of shrine to her father. And she actually said, this, my dad, my father loved Yuri like a son. And I think you see it in that picture. So this guy is the top man. He's actually protected everywhere, everywhere he goes by the KGB in case CIA agents find out who he is, identify him and kidnap him. <laughs> assassinate him. I yeah. mean, he's really serious. He's not only known by his initials inside <clears throat> SP. Look at the other side. The other side is picture 12. On the American side, we've got the famous or infamous Werner von Braun. German, ex-Nazi, made a professor by Adolf Hitler for building the V2 missile that was used to rain down destruction on London and Antwerp in 1944. The first basically ballistic missile revolutionary, sort of handsome, suave, charismatic, but with a very dark past that was not properly revealed at the time. In fact, it was covered up by the CIA quite deliberately because he had this SS past. In fact, we've got a photograph of him in number 13 where you see him in his former guise with other people, as it were. So there's, there's the younger Werner von Braun, very handsome and suave with his kind of SS and German cohorts in I think 1944. But he was also the man that went on to build the Saturn V rocket that took the first human beings to the moon with Apollo. I mean, this guy is a genius. And what you have are these two core geniuses. One is this kind of flawed, um, brilliant rocket scientist with this very dark background, you know, where concentration camp labor being used to build his V2 missiles that were destroying London, but went on to become the sort of white hope, literally the white hope of the American space program. And on the other side, you've got that guy Korolev, who had been one of the victims of Stalin's purges and had been sent to a concentration camp in the Gulag in Siberia when he was still in his twenties and had his jaw smashed, was very lucky not to actually be killed by the NKVD, which was the predecessors to the KGB, um, amazingly survived, survived that horrific experience where millions died under Stalin's terror and then ended up becoming this secret architect of the entire missile and space force. You've got these great, big, colorful personalities that are driving their respective space programs forward to get ahead of each other. The difference is that where obviously Korolev knows all about Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun desperately wants to know who his wife is. He doesn't because it's a secret. Yeah, that's extraordinary. Mm. So Yuri Gagarin has now been selected as, as the yeah. guy who's gonna go first. And there's obviously all of this preparation and all of this training that goes into the, the launch. Uh, yeah. I wanna talk about that flight and specifically we're sort of right before the flight there's this last minute uh, Soviet official who, who needs to stop Gagarin and he paints something onto his helmet. Yeah. Can, can you tell us what was going on there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you've got to understand how last minute everything is, okay? <laughs> can I just backtrack very slightly? And I will yeah. answer a question very, very quickly to show you what we're talking about in terms of the sort of technology, the differences, the sort of primitiveness, the risks that are being taken. I just want you to compare this. If we look at picture 20, just, and I will answer your question. If we look mm -hmm. at picture number 20, you will see the what was absolutely state of the art in 1961 that is the interior of mission control that's an actual color picture from 1961 a mission control in cape canaveral as it was then which was basically guiding all of these spacecraft and the first human in space would be actually guided from that port this is really high-tech stuff okay it really is i mean it's it's got this ibm computers being involved i mean it's really quite advanced. compare that to the next picture number 21 which was the launch bunker 
in the Cosmodrome. I mean, look at that difference. The launch bunker, and I wish we could put the side by side, but the launch bunker in the Cos Cosmodrome, but don't worry if you can't, launch bunker in the Cosmodrome, which sent Yuri Gagarin in. I mean, it looks like an inside of a World War II submarine. I mean, it's really, really primitive, okay? So you're talking about primitive. You're talking about the one thing they've got is a great big missile, <laughs> and they've got a guy sitting on top of it. Okay, so this, everything is done last minute. So he's put in a, he even nearly didn't have a spacesuit because there almost wasn't time to develop one in order to get him. And that's how far it gets. It's that crazy. They do finally develop a spacesuit for him and they manage it for three of the cosmonauts, but the others will have to wait. So he gets into a space and then what they do is they put, they put him in and literally minutes before he's due to be bussed out to the secret launch pad where the rocket is waiting to go on April the 12th, 1961. And he's had a sleepless night that he's lied about that and said he slept perfectly. <laughs> and Kitov is waiting in the wings. He's also got to be dressed up, hoping that Gagarin's going to have a nervous breakdown or a leak in his suit or get the flu and yeah. somehow or other he's going to replace it. And at that moment, at that moment, what you have is something going, Christ almighty, what happens if something goes wrong and he lands as he's supposed to back on Russian soil, not in the sea as the Americans did, but on mother Russian soil. And somebody thinks he's an American spy because he's going to be parachuting down and he's going to look, nobody's going to know who he is. And it's not poss impossible that a bunch of local farmers will get their pitchforks and kill him, which really easily have happened because an American spy, flying an American spy plane the previous year, a man called Gary Powers, had been shot down wearing an orange spacesuit, the same color as Yuri Gagarin's, and, and had been basically attacked when he, he landed. So there was a real fear this guy could do this, the, the greatest feat in human history at that point, <laughs> and they get killed by, by a bunch of farmers. <laughs> yeah. so somebody said, what do we do? What do we do? And somebody said, well, we've got to paint CCCP, which is USSR, on his helmet. And they literally find a bottle of paint from somewhere, <laughs> red paint, and they grab the paint, and they paint it, and, and they don't even, there's no time for the paint even to dry before they, I mean, I've got all this witness about this, it's amazing. And yeah. they brought this, all this was kept secret, by the way, for decades. Mm -hmm. And they paint CCCP on the helmet in this wet red paint, <laughs> and before the paint has time to dry, bung him on the bus, whoosh, out to the launch pad. So that's yeah. how crazy it is, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so they, so, so they take him out to the launch pad. He's, he's yeah. got paint drying on his helmet. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and they're ready to go. So he, they are ready what's, to go. Yeah. what happens next? Well, then he gets onto the launch pad and he gets onto his capsule right at the very, very top. And then what happens is they've got to start this thing. I got a quite fun picture, actually. If you look at number 21A for a moment, okay, this is the actual panel that is used to start the biggest nuclear missile in the world. And if you look there, there's a kind of keyhole, like a car keyhole, you know, it looks like an old fashioned car. And if you look to number 21B, you'll see the actual key that is used to actually go in that hole. So basically, oh, wow. in that, it's how it works. It's, I love this stuff. You basically put the key in, you turn it two clicks and you start the biggest <laughs> missile in the world. With yeah. a man sitting on top of it. So that actually, what happens, they put him in there. I'm not gonna go into all the things that could go wrong. Let me just show you one quick picture, which is 32. This is actually an American picture of an exploding rocket above Cape Canaveral in June 19, in 1959. This was photographed and, re and released, but that was typical, not only in America, but also secretly in Russia. That's the kind of thing that could happen seconds after launch. I mean, it's pretty dramatic. In that particular case, this rocket decided to do a U-turn and head straight back to the launch bunker with the guys sitting inside. And just as it did so, they actually triggered an explosion inside it to stop that from happening. So there are so many things at this point that can go wrong with the rocket, with the various stages, with what's gonna happen when he's up there and various things about how he's gonna get back down again, because even that has not been tested. I mean, not properly. No one's done this properly before. And most of the dogfights that have been supposedly paving the way, all but one of them has actually gone wrong. And even in the one that went right, the dogs were vomiting and tearing at their harnesses in obvious distress. But at 9.07 a.m. on the morning of April the 12th, 1961, we get picture four. 
that key is turned. And if we can go to picture four, you'll see what happens. It's an actual color picture from a film that was shot and released many years later. Mm -hmm. That rocket is on its way. And Yuri Gagarin famously cries out the word poyakali, he says, which means let's go. And this thing goes. And the, I have watched one of these things go. Very similar rocket in, nine, in 2019. And I watched it from a kilometer away to see how it feels and looks. It was three astronauts going to the International Space Station at the same launch pad that Yuri Gagarin went wow. from. And the last time that launch pad is ever going to be used again, I managed to wangle access, took 28 hours to get to this cosmodrome, which is really difficult to get inside. And it's a whole story in itself. And I actually watched this thing go with human beings on top. And it's unbelievable. I mean, the, it's, it's an earthquake. It is, it is the wall of sound and the way the sky lights up. You cannot, no film I've ever seen does justice to what this feels like to watch, particularly when you know there are humans on top. Can you imagine what that was like with the first human being sitting on top in a much more primitive situation? And this thing goes and everybody watches it go. And there's a heart stopping, I'm not gonna tell you because it's in the book, there's a heart stopping 11 minutes that then takes place as it races towards space and at something like 11 minutes later, I think at 9.28 a.m. Moscow time, the last stage of the rocket, 90% fuel is this rocket, 90% fuel, the last final third stage detaches and leaves Yuri Gagarin in space in something that looks as an artist's impression, looks like number 15. Can we just get that up for a second? And it leaves him up in number in that. There's your sphere, okay? The bottom bit, if you can hold that picture, please. The bottom bit is the kind of retro rocket package, you know, the braking rockets, they called it, and all the electronics and stuff like that. He's inside that. And he sits, if we can go back to number nine, he sits in there, in that sphere. And he feels himself lifted from his seat, even though he's still strapped in. And he then turns to his right, where you can see in the top right a porthole. And he turns to his right and he looks out of the window and he sees something that no human eye has ever seen. He sees the earth. He sees the earth from space. He sees this incredibly beautiful planet beneath him. And the capsule is rotating very, very slowly. Um, on its axis, and he sees the Earth slide past his window, and he says over the radio, at this point he can be heard, he says, I can see the Earth, I can see the Earth. And he, it's beautiful, and the, the atmosphere is so thin, and it's so blue, it's a color that's just like so pure. And then he sees these, the blackness of space, and he sees the stars which don't twinkle, they don't twinkle because there's no atmosphere which makes them to it's unfiltered. And then suddenly, or not so suddenly, but gradually as this thing is turning, the capsule, that little tiny sphere that he's sitting inside is suddenly flooded with the most radiant, pure light from the sun that fills this. It's so bright, it has to shut the shutters. It's just filled with unfiltered light, there's no atmosphere. And he becomes ecstatic. I mean, he becomes euphoric. I mean, he is seeing something no one has seen at that yeah. point, you know? And it is, and he's not even gonna get down or not. And he's <laughs> not gonna be speaking to it. And as he does so, he is racing across the USSR, the Eastern, he's racing across essentially 11 time zones at that point, at 10 times the speed of a rifle bullet in that tiny sphere. And suddenly he's racing into the sunset. He's just left, it was nine, it's nine o'clock in the morning for him. Within 30 minutes, it's nighttime. And 35 minutes after that, it's daytime again. And he sees the dawn rising, this time over the Atlantic Ocean. He's got all the way from basically between the Soviet Union and Alaska, right up in the north. He's gone right down to almost the South Pole in 35 minutes. And then he comes up under Cape Horn on the southern tip of the, of the Americas 
and up into the Atlantic Ocean, heading back towards West Africa at that speed. And all that's taken about less than 50 minutes to do. I mean, it is, it is, an, it is the ride of rides. And what I try to do in my book is put you in there. You know, not academic history, but based on what he really said in, in, in secret briefings that weren't actually released for decades, and, and in some cases, not for 50 more and plus years. Um, and some things have still not been released, actually. Some things are still hidden in archives, but to put you there in that little sphere, traveling around the world, and what did that feel like? What was that like? What was it like to have those moments of both euphoria and fear that you may never come home again? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really extraordinary journey, and I think your book tells it very beautifully. Thank you. Now, as we start to wrap up, I wanted to finish on so the, the flight is successful and, and Yuri's coming back, but then- but very when, nearly not. <laughs> right. When, when he gets there, it's, it's kind of this insane story. Can you pick up yeah. as, as he comes back uh, into yeah. Russia? Well, he, there is a, because of, the system is so primitive that they haven't actually worked out a way for a human being to land inside that sphere, even right. though it's a parachute bringing it down because he'll just kill himself if he lands right. inside. So, the program, secret program is that at about 20 odd thousand feet, slightly more than that actually, he ejects, think of a jet fighter, he ejects from that sphere. He's actually catapulted out <laughs> and he parachutes separately. And he parachutes separately um, from the capsule and they both land separately. Right. Because of a whole sort of host of things that go wrong, he's hundreds of kilometers off course. <laughs> I mean, yeah. he's just, I mean, it just, everything goes wrong. But by one of those coincidences that you simply could not make up, but this story is chock full of, yeah. he, in the whole of the USSR, having gone around the planet, the one place he actually ends up is almost on top of the town where he'd studied iron foundry work <laughs> back in 19, <laughs> in, 19, in the 1950s. He actually ends up f literally coming back over there. So he could, but he's looking down over his feet and there he sees, I recognize this place. And it's, it's where he went to university, went to college, oh, technical <laughs> college, just study. So he knows the territory, but of course there's no one there. They all think he's hundreds of kilometers away. They've lost track. It's, there's no technology. There's no mission control. There's nothing. Yeah. He's on his own parachuting down somewhere over the Volga River. And even that there's all kinds of things that go wrong even there, his breathing tube gets stuck. He starts to head towards the Volga, which is a huge river. His life raft snaps off, you know, disappears and everything. It's, 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 but he's done it. He's just got to get this last bit. He right. ends up to cut a delicious story, right <laughs> shorter. He ends up in a potato field in the middle of nowhere. In a mm -hmm. tiny, a tiny, and the only people there, you know, we're used to having, seeing images of, in America, of destroyers and aircraft carriers and helicopters yeah. and all that stuff. He, he's in a potato field, okay? And, and, and he lands on this potato with CCCP, you know, on his helmet, <laughs> yeah. you know, pitchfork to death, which is only painted, he's, he's been only 106 minutes to go around the whole yeah. planet at that incredible speed. Ends up on this plow field. And the only people there are an old lady and her granddaughter picking potatoes uh, in a bucket, you know? And so he goes up to them, hi, and they <laughs> run away. Because <laughs> they think, oh, right, yeah. this guy, what is this guy? You know, the CCCP yeah. is not helping. It's not doing anything. They run. It's just a guy who looks weird, okay? Yeah. And finally he manages to convince them who he is and they haven't been listening to the radio, which has now announced the fact that he was in orbit. Right. Um, they hadn't been, they've been fucking potatoes. They've got no radio there. And incredibly, he says to them, because he needs to kind of report where he is, he actually, this is, this is God's gospel truth, um, because I've read and interviewed and witnesses and everything. He actually says, how can I find a phone? <laughs> and they say the nearest phone is in the collective village, three miles or five kilometers down the road. And the only way you can get there is either to walk or you can borrow our horse and cart if you know how to bridle a horse. So this is a guy who's been traveling at 18,000 miles an hour around the planet, who's seen a sunset and a sunrise, who's seen stars, the thinness of the atmosphere, everything. Yeah. And it's like, can I bridle a horse? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at the very last moment before he's about to do this, 
he is actually met by the commander of an artillery battery that saw him coming down on the radar yeah. and yeah. actually intercepts and puts him on a jeep and then <laughs> takes him to the back and then things start to unfold. And within 24 hours of that happening, he is unquestionably the most famous human being on earth. I mean, he really is. He became this like that. Um, it's an incredible and very sort of darkly comic and sort of, dare I say, wonderfully Russian arrival. <laughs> I think it's very colorful and I love it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, it's- This after arriving, number 23. Oh, look, I love this. This is a completely unofficial picture which actually um, you, the Soviets did not release in, during the Soviet, but look at that. This is actually when he gets the Soviet art, artillery battery and look at his face. He's literally, he's just all sweaty and smiling and they're all hugging and it's a fun, it's just somebody just snapped that picture completely illegally. Wow. And, and it last, amazingly it survived. Um, and there he is sort of within 30 minutes of, of, of his landing from, uh, from space. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it is seriously remarkable. Um, Stephen, I think we're just about out of time. I want to thank you again for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. And Stephen's book, Beyond, is available now wherever books are sold. You can get it through the link in the YouTube video or at the local and independent bookseller. Uh, the book is an absolute joy, right? And I really do recommend it. For everyone who joined us today, we look forward to seeing you at our next Talks at Google event. Please stay safe and take care. Thank you very much.